don't know us, I recognize a lot of people here. My name's Eric Darden, and I'm the horticulture manager for the Epcot International Flower Garden Festival. And this is my peer. Heather. Yeah. Heather is an area manager at Disney. She and I co-manage a nursery together. And she won't say this, but I will. She's probably, she definitely here is our color expert. And I would say one of the better people in the Southeast uh, U.S. when it comes to using color in the garden. So I'm, all, I'm along because I'm going to help any flower questions that you might have. Because I've been away from plants for way too long. So, we um, work good together. Yeah, we work together. For, well, when I first started here in 1988, Heather was the foreman and one of the foremen of the nursery. So we've been working together truly for 26 years. Um, before we get going, do y'all have any questions? Well, first I should tell you, notice that we have a helmet and hard hat. We're going to get to a certain point where you're going to have to put on a helmet or hard hat or you're not going to the garden. Um, we did this three or four years ago, I can't remember which, a really, really cold tour. Um, and since then, Disney has, we're always evaluating our, our safety policies, um, of course, um, guest and cast safety is our number one priority. And we've just decided that anytime there's anything that's um, a construction area, we need to make sure that everyone's as safe as they possibly can be, which I think we're all asked to wear closed shoes. Um, and we will issue safety glasses, hard hats, and, and, and vests. You only have to wear them while you're in those gardens, but pretty quickly we'll get to a place where you'll have to put them on. We'll provide them. When we leave that, you can take them off, and when we get to the next one, we can put it back on. Um, so we do have construction walls up, and we're still doing our last plannings, but except for the front entrance, pretty much all the big elements are in, aren't they? Yeah, they are. All the Is topiary. Permit in? Yes. yes, she went in this morning. Last night. Very yeah, good. It is. Good to see you now. Yeah, as a matter of fact. That's the only one you didn't get a picture. That's the only one I so haven't far. seen yet. So. <laughs> you haven't seen? Oh, there's some there's some. Well, you've probably seen the monsters, though. too. I have seen the monsters. Yeah. yeah. Um, We're going to give you some surprises, though, right? Even on the ones you've seen, you're going to get some surprises. Yeah. Um, oh, no, actually, last night, um, the uh, right behind the logo, what we call the logo bed, mm -hmm. that went in last night, too. Oh, nice. So uh, you'll see that as well. And is it the logo bed? No. So it's in your mind. That's the butterfly house is still pretty rough. That's always, it's just planning. That's the last minute thing. Um, and of course, has, has, has the press even talked about the um, glass sculpture that's going to the butterfly house? Or is that going to be a big surprise? <laughs> the, the gentleman who did, Craig Mitchell Smith, who did the poppies for us last year at Oz, he's doing this gigantic, um, looks like monarchs, a flock or flock. group or whatever you would be of butterflies which are going in that house uh, that structure is going in that house uh, it'll go in next Wednesday so we won't see that obviously when you're putting in extremely valuable fragile glass you get all the heavy work done first and then you put that in um, well, that's going to be, that's gonna be a, a nice addition don't if you don't know the last thing that we always install is the front entrance uh, not to say we won't be doing I mean, we'll still be tweaking things like when the guests are coming in opening day we'll be but as far as the big install, it's going to be the front entrance. And we always do that on Monday night, or two days before it opens. We've done that since the very first festival 21 years ago. The idea being we give ourselves an extra night in case something goes horribly wrong. Nothing has ever gone horribly wrong, but every one of us believed that if we were to change it and go on Tuesday night, that would be the year something would go wrong. So um, we do have one extra day when the festival is not officially open that you can see the front entrance. As you all know, we've done a lot of different front entrances over the years. It's the, it's the element we give the most thought to. We think you get one chance to make a first impression. So I won't be surprised if within the next month, Heather and I and some other folks are already starting to bounce around what we're going to do for front entrance next year. We like to have that pretty much nailed down by June or July. This year, we've done something that we keep leaning on more and more, and that's going to Walt's classic shorts. Um, I firmly believe the best front entrances we've ever done are either exact lifts from some of Walt's shorts, which would be like the Hawaiian holiday. That was a total lift. Every goofy surfing, Mickey and Minnie, I mean, you can go look at that, that film and see that short scene where we got it from. Some of the others, like the camping one, the goofy fishing, that was stealing from several ones. And then the picnic, you know, that was stealing from several ones, but I shouldn't say stealing, I guess. I should say <laughs> being inspired by Walt's work. Um, and that's what we're doing this year as well. We've looked at several of the, the outdoor ones. There's one with Goofy with the butterfly net, so we've got our big Goofy with the butterfly net. Of course, Goofy fails, so the butterflies are actually on his back. He's looking for them, and they're sitting on him. And then Donald and Daisy are in the front of the bed. We've also done something 
which yeah, I don't know how many people are going to notice it, but I don't know if we're challenging ourselves. We just think it was fun. The advertising campaign that Disney's done the last several years on the billboards has shown the computer-generated characters. We wanted to get that look. So we've tried to make our characters look like that. Um, we've planted their faces to look different. Their eyes are different. So it was quite a challenge to do it. I think we're successful. Y'all will be the ultimate judges, of course. Um, but we wanted to make a change and, and make change the characters a little bit. It, it, it really in, involved making a new um, frame for, for uh, Donald, or a new head at least, because he has a B on it. You can't see that, but you will see in the logo bed, the Mickey and Minnie, which have that look as well. Um, they're already in. So anyway, that's what's going in next week. We're excited about it. I don't know why. There were years where we weren't using characters in the front entrance, but it just seems like more and more we're leaning on those big characters. It almost feels like it's right when you walk into the Flower and Garden Festival and you see classic characters in the front. Um, so I, I don't think I'm tipping the hand for next year because we're not sure. But if I had money to put on it, I'd say you'll probably see classic characters there next year as well. Um, but again, I might be wrong. Um, Heather may come up with a great idea with something we've never done before or someone else might. So do you have any questions before we get going? I would like to add one thing though, when we're brainstorming, a lot of this is just done in brainstorming groups and you know, one person throws in an idea and another a next, but somehow, it's not the, it's not an official theme in any way, but you will see a lot of butterflies. So, this display, Eric mentioned, you know, the big butterfly net, so when we go to the logo bed, I'm not going to tell you the butterfly you're going to see there because I want you to be surprised, but you will see butterflies throughout. And she mentioned brainstorming. It brings back a memory I have. So my favorite front entrance, I really think, is Hawaiian Holiday with Goofy on the surfboard because putting a, a two-ton, 14-foot Goofy on a six-foot topiary wave is a challenge. Literally, that idea came about in a conversation Heather and I had in front of the bathrooms at the nursery complex in a five-minute conversation. We went, you may not remember, we went from Stitch on a surfboard. So she said, too bad we can't put, and she said, we could use that up front. I said, Stitch wasn't big enough. And she said, too bad we can't put Goofy on a surfboard. I said, I bet we can. We walked to Tom Wyatt's office, who does our install. And the way, he's the kind of guy who loves a challenge, so the way you get him to agree to something is challenge him. So I walked in and said, and Heather was there and said, I bet we couldn't put Goofy on top of a surfboard on a wave, could we? It's like, yeah, I think we could do that. That's how that, so it's not like we're sitting in some conference room. That was just a casual conversation that turned into, I think, the strongest furniture we've ever done. But that's, that's just my opinion. The uh, inspiration we have from that. Um, this is a really a lot, a, a I've been telling people it's going to look different on the big ones. And, and, um, and they do. I, I really like it. We've got the living plant material back on the faces. In the past, gosh, six, eight years, we've used the dried moss. I really like having the plant material. I think we still capture the emotion. Um, I don't know, I just like them. And I love the ladybugs on, on minis. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And he has a, he has a better on the and you know, the thing to keep in mind is, it's not just a bunch of horticulturists coming up and working with this. This was really dictated by our, our um, um, WDI folks, our character artists. You know, they're the ones who, we don't decide what a character has to look like. That's done by other folks. So we work with them continually to make sure that we're getting, um, what's the word I'm looking for, not authentic, but a, a true look for Mickey and Minnie. Um, yeah, uh, it, it has to be uh, on model. It has to be. It has to be right, and we're not the final arbiters of that. That's that's done by our our design group. So you know, it, it's a it's a challenge. Not a challenge, but you, know, you do it, and they come down and look at it. You do it, and they come down and look at it, and it has to be right. It's like daily changes to, to get them right, and um, yeah, this. I think we got this Does it, and I think it looks so springy. Yeah, talk about the flowers if you want. Well, the, the flowers are always a huge challenge because you don't know what you're going to get until the end. So, for instance, this isn't the exact palette we were going to put in last night, but we added to it, beefed it up, and look how beautiful. I love this. I didn't know you were going to do that. Well, we weren't. You reminds me of Donald last year, who was sort of the logo with the butterfly. Right. Like that. Well, this year Donald will have to be on his head. You're like, in that angry look. Yeah, that's a lot yeah, of fun. The hydrangeas were like a last minute beef it up. So, here's, here's what it looks like the morning 
here's what it's going to look like Tuesday morning as we're loading in. We have all these annuals planned that are going in there. We're going to get the topiary set. And this starts at midnight. The minute the park clears, we have people lined up. Um, ready to go in. And even the order of the trucks is important because you have to have the trucks parked right and the crane has to be in the right spot. Because you realize, you know, this is a very tight area to come in and we'll probably come in at Germany. And we have to make sure nothing on the truck is taller than a monorail beam. So, you know, we're driving in. Um, and while the trucks and everything are driving in, the Epcot gardeners will already be up there pulling out all those annuals, raking the bed out, getting it ready, adding soil and fertilizer. They'll come in, the first thing we do, the cranes will start setting the topiaries. Um, and once the topiaries and there's a fountain going in and some trees, once that is all set, then we start petting the bedding plants. So now it's coming around 3.30, we're doing good, 3, maybe 3.30 in the morning, the bedding plants get planted. And then here's what happened, Heather and Patrick and all of our real color experts will start looking and there'll be gardeners growing back to our holding area and getting stuff. Grabbing stuff. And then Heather will be walking around just dropping plants here. So you have what you plan. And then there's probably another 40% of bedding plants put in because at front entrance you can't have too much color. So everyone says, "What's your bedding plant mix going to be here?" Well, it's going to start with this, but what it's going to end up in, I don't know. Um, and really, Heather's the, probably the biggest determiner of that. And then we were just discussing the hydrangeas were not in the original plant palette, but there they are. So. And look by what they add. Yeah. yeah. My garden, and I don't know if it's really my garden, but this is our color garden, and it's sponsored by Transition Lenses. And I give a presentation that I love to give on color, and it's the language of color. So it's just a fun, let's talk about color, maybe not even plants, let's, let's just talk about how color affects us. So that's what inspired this garden, and then when we found out Transition Lenses was coming on, it evolved into the color wheel and a a message, and I'll tell you, for my presentation and for the cast member, for the um, guests and cast that come through here, the fun part is that it's kind of a teaching garden because we have the color wheel displayed in flowers, and then we have some seasonal gardens that we'll talk about, and then the children's activity. I couldn't believe it when I heard is coloring in the color garden. <laughs> so I think this is going to be a, a Something that people really get something okay. out of, they get well, to take I'm home. Now. I'm going to let you peek in. We, um, there's going to be signage, a lot of signage in this garden, but it's okay. really colorful. Actually, it's um, the pots will come out and be displayed after the wall comes down. One of the challenges we have depends on our sunflowers. They're naked right now because the rabbits have come in here and, and helped themselves to our beautiful flowers. So we work with a pest management team and they'll come in and put down some scrim that'll just make the rabbits like, not like their lunch so much and leave our flowers on them. And Eric mentioned how important opening day is. So up until opening day, we're gonna be tweaking and making little changes in this garden. We don't quite like how the spring relates to the summer here. So we want to put more yellow in the summer, more pink in the spring, but we'll be doing that kind of thing until the very last moment. Yeah, really. On Wednesday morning, we'll still be, yeah. we'll still be putting plants in here. We have a critical eye. Do <laughs> you put water features in here? I know you have water features in here. This, this one does not have a water feature. Just color. And, and it will have a kids' activity, though. There is a kids' activity in this bar. Well, you've had very last. weather. You know, one of the challenges you have when you're in horticulture is we're kind of at the mercy of Mother Nature. We don't, we can't control that. The advantage of it is we always have a good excuse. Um, but this year has been very challenging because if you've noticed, it's just been very cloudy. We haven't had a lot of sun. Everyone says, oh, it's the cold weather bothering you. The cold weather doesn't bother us that much. It's a lack of sun. So Heather and I are just loving this because I wish we'd have had a lot more of this the last two months. Most flowers want sun. Right. <laughs> so, um, as y'all know, this has been the Audubon Garden for the past couple of years. We've kind of taken it another step up. We're calling it Hummingbirds 
at home, and I did want to introduce. Actually, I'm really glad it's like this because, you know, one of the things I really like about these is the technical challenge it presents us. When we started using more and more topiaries, we have 79 character topiaries this year and 99 total. Uh, hand watering topiaries takes forever. And so one of the things we did and our team did, um, I can't claim any credit, notice that irrigation there, how many different tubes you have coming out. Our topiaries truly do have irrigation zones just like your yard at the house. We'll have zones for areas that need lots of water, zones for areas that need not as much, and the amount of water that comes out in those zones is dictated um, by the, the type of tubing we put in there. So if on that you'll see that it's, you can't hardly see, but it's numbered, it looks like one through 13 zones, or maybe 15, or 13 zones. Back in the nursery, we'll have a, a key that tells us, you know, if, if one part's not getting water, we'll know exactly what zone to go to and start trying to trace the lines out to, to fix it. And we mentioned earlier, I don't think, I don't think. Yes, I this is Mater's Parks, Plants, and Play Garden. I don't think we mentioned it earlier when we were talking about the topiaries, but once the festival opens, these beautiful topiaries, you can see all the sculpted work on them. Somebody has to come out here every day for the duration of the festival and maintain them. So every day at like one in the morning, yep. we have a crew that comes out here and works until park opening to keep these topiary looking so nice. Yeah, you would think the poor team that's been struggling to get all these done for opening day, get a break, but they don't. They transfer over here, shift change, and take care of them for the next 75 days. But as you might imagine, people who do this, this, this for a living are generally pretty passionate about what they're doing. A lot of detail work. And then, uh, head on up here to the... Nice place to stand. All the color that surrounds you here. This is part of the, the Mater's uh, plants and pl play garden as well. This is the, the game you do it yourself by using the car parts to identify. You identify the different car parts in the shapes that we made. Then we of course transitioned over into the um, the garden of treat, the outdoor, uh, HGTV garden. But what I wanted to talk about here is just all the color. And that's one of our goals. We often think about these, these areas where we have these big vistas. How can we put more, like basically we'll say, where can we put more color? And I think this is a nice spot to notice. Notice our floaters. We're really pleased this year, you'll notice about a quarter of them have a plant material going down the side. Dichondra, right? Yeah. It's dichondra. We've always wanted to find something that'll cascade over the black um, styrofoam floaters. Sweet potatoes worked well several years ago, but unfortunately they took over the whole floater. So we think this is going to be a solution, and I'll just give you a hint. You come out here at night, and you'll get a surprise on some of these floaters. Uh, I'll just say Ellie. Those are like my favorite. 120. 120. 120. Um, just say LED lights allow you to do a lot of fun things. So uh, <laughs> some of the floaters are actually lit this year. We're here so early, we never get to enjoy Yeah, right. I've never seen it. <laughs> TV garden, Gardener's Retreat, 
and I think the name is appropriate. One of the things we know about our guests is they really appreciate having a place where they can just sit down and relax for a while. You know, Disney Park, there's all kinds of things going on. But the nice thing about Epcot particularly is there are these little nooks and crannies where it is very relaxing in a beautiful location. So we just set a spot here where the guests can come in, maybe have a beverage, sit down and relax. we got some little play equipment with the mushrooms for their kids if they, if they want to. Um, just more and more we're trying to put these little areas in the garden because we know our guests do appreciate that. It's just a pleasant place to be. A pleasant place to be. The guests will walk in what we just did. There'll be a cast member there making sure it's not it's done one at a time. The guests then can pose like they're a goaltender, um, getting ready to try to stop Goofy from, from scoring, scoring the penalty kick. And of course, Donald's a teammate. Notice they're roughly dressed the same. Yeah, they, that's why we have the uh, forever lawn here. Yes. There's no way you, in three days of walking, having guests on turf, it would be dead. So um, that's why the forever lawn is in this area. And then we're actually, uh, our team's coming in next week. We're going to stripe the, stripe the grass with the turf paint, just like it's a real, uh, real soccer pitch. That's great. You actually are inside here. Yeah. This will probably be one of our first. We did some frames years ago. We haven't done a lot of like photo ops. The flowering garden, especially, I don't think we've ever done a true photo op with the topiary. This will be the first one we've done. Yeah. And this actually stays up until mid -Ju July. Oh, okay. Boys, you know, I almost walked right by here. It's just kind of like, I don't want to say we have to stop and smell the, the flowers. You've done this so long, we have to stop and appreciate. Uh, yeah, we're walking by 45,000 bedding plants, and, and I wasn't even going to mention it. So, you know, this is something we've done every year at the Flower and Garden Festival, and I think it's one of the signature things that guests look for. Um, when we went from 52 to 60 days, we started having to plant this twice. These, all these violas and, and petunias won't make it till the end of festival. So sometime in April, almost every one of these bedding plants are going to get changed out. It won't be all at once. As the crop starts going down, they'll replace them. The, the folks who work here are so good at looking at a bedding plant crop, and they can tell you three days from now this crop's going to crash. It's all these bedding plants. We've done it every year. If you go back and look at old photos of this, before we started opening the festival early like we are now, they were nice. But since we've opened early and we can use these violas and the winter crops, they just pop. I mean, that's just so vibrant. Um, and you can read the designs. Well, it's just, it's just a nice place, by the way. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, and then the butterfly house, we didn't go in because there's nothing yet to see. That's one of our last minute plannings. We are only having one fairy this year, Tinkerbell, but we're showing lots of fairy houses in, in, the, in the house and something special. We had guests just love all those fairy houses that we do. And Jenny may have the dates. The ladies who actually make those fairy houses for us are gonna be here in the park for two weeks selling the fairy houses. So, um, I just think there's a lot more content this year than we've had in the past. I mean, we have three separate gardens just in this area where last year was one garden. It's going to be a lot to see. Oh, wait. Sorry. Will you be having the nighttime, the, the, the fiber optics and the glowing gardens this year? It's, it's just like last year. Just like last year? Yeah. Uh, everything's open except the butterfly house and a few others that won't be open. Um, transitions isn't because it's a light garden. Right. You can't see. But, but the play areas will definitely be open. We're going to... Okay, we won't put you in that one. <laughs> So Heather and I were just laughing that they look so small now. When you see him at the farm, you know, 12 feet of monster, he looks like a, a monster. In the garden, he really fits in profile well. We love this garden. Um, first of all, it's a play area, which we always want. Our goal is, and I think we've achieved it, to make the Flower and Garden Festival the best time of year to bring your children to Epcot with all of the different play areas, the kids' activities, and our partner, um, who's been a partner for 15 years, Landscape Structures, helps us with this material, these, these place st structures, which is just incredible. This is a new structure over here. Can't wait for the kids to see the kids on that. Um, and of course, our play surface for Everlon, and you can see what uh, Ty and his team's doing. We're actually putting the monster's footsteps in the, in the Forever Lawn, so you get to see that taking place. And of course, the topiaries. One of the things we tried to do was make sure the entire garden theme with the, 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 the garden, um, Mike and Sully's monstrous garden. So what we try to do is pick weird, monstrous looking, 
goofy plants, not referring to another character at that point, <laughs> but um, and, and put them in the garden, some things that guests may not have seen before. Large uh, leaves, big foliage, right. and then we customize, they customize the play equipment. Yes, and you'll notice um, how the instructor even customized all this play equipment, the eyes on the, on the, uh, the eyes on the equipment, the, the theming. That's really nice of them to do that for us. Um, the way these things work is they'll loan us this equipment, uh, and then when it's done, they'll look to sell it. So they won't be able to sell it with all this Disney-themed stuff on it. So that's really nice of landscape structures to, to go to that extra extra trouble. But it makes for you know it's going to get a lot of a lot of coverage and a lot of guests are going to ask. So, if I want the like wait, that, wait, I would wait. think a playground would want it. Like oh, that. they probably you would. Raise the price. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we we want our. Own. I know. <laughs> Heather, would you tell everyone a little bit about some, what some of these monstrous plants are? Gosh, we have tea plants, we have fiddly figs, we have giant bromeliads, and the interesting thing about this garden, it's very tropical, but we tried to pl pick plant material that could survive in full sun, because you can see this is in the blazing full sun, so any of the bromeliads you see can grow in some kind of sun, largely cannas, bananas. Ponytail palms. Ponytail palms. Big sea grapes. So, you know, last year as we ended the Oz, you know, it closed, we thought a lot of Oz Garden. We thought it was the most massive garden we've done. Our thoughts immediately turned to, all right, how can we beat that? Because really, you know, none of us are doing our jobs. If A lot of times you hear people say, gosh, it gets better every year. Well, it ought to. I mean, that's what, that's what we do. So our thoughts turned to, all right, we did this great garden with Oz. What can we do that beats it? Um, and you're fortunate, Reed is one of our architects, um, kind of probably has as much as anyone to do with what ends up in these gardens. Um, and that's her over there. But we, we knew we had these new topiaries, we wanted to use them. We, so it wasn't hard to say, all right, let's make them part of the, the playground. And then after that, you know, it's, it, then it's just details. Um, once we knew that, and we probably knew that by June, would you say? And you know, something else I thought about as you were talking, Eric, is that we don't have flowers flowers, the typical flowers in this garden. So part of our challenge was, I mean, if you turn around look at that beautiful color, we have a lot of color there, but it's not flowers. It's texture, foliage. And, and one of the things, too, that that some of y'all heard this, but it, it just talks about the challenge of the topiaries. The Mike topiary, when we first started doing him, and we knew he had to be a certain size, the engineer came back, because we have to have all these engineering reports, it's metal frames, they're very heavy. I think Sully weighs 4,300 pounds. Oh. Um, so Mike probably weighs a thousand pounds. The engineer came back and said, "There's no way we can engineer legs that big that'll support the weight. We can't do it." Well, fortunately, we didn't give up. One of our designers thought of the books. See the books behind Mike? That's not a prop. That's what's holding Mike up. Um, that supports almost all of his weight. The legs help, but most of the support comes from the books. So, you know, truly a form-following function. I mean, we had to have that to be able to do that topiary. Yeah, and you know, it's fun to come in here, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of kids playing. Um, and of course, we, the nice thing about this garden, all kids, this is for younger children, uh, two to five, and this is for, for older children. And you will see adults on this as well. Um, we, do, we, don't, we don't stop adults. Y'all actually got to witness something that happens every year at the Flower and Garden Festival, and that's things we don't anticipate. Those were four large magnolias being offloaded. Yesterday, day before yesterday, on our, our horticulture team walk, we were in that garden, and we got to a certain place and we realized the way we made the garden, a guest, the guests can see right backstage where y'all just walk. So, I mean, it was literally Wednesday we said we need to get four large trees in. So what, two days later we already have the magnolias being planted. One day later. <laughs> one day later they were here. They were here yesterday. They were here yesterday. And Heather's proud of that because she gets the plant material. <laughs> <laughs> one day. The flower and garden for years know that as the years have gone by, starting like five, six, seven years ago, you started seeing more and more edible plants in the landscape. Um, the Rainbow Garden had a bunch. And we did that responding to what our guests wanted. Not only did they tell us that they liked to see the edible plants, but we count. And anytime we would add, change a garden from a regular garden to an edible landscape, we could as much as triple or quadruple the people who went in that garden. So that's been in the back of our mind for years. And then starting last year, finally, we made the decision, well, we're not telling the whole story. We show the plants, the guests don't get to try it. So starting last year, we, we, we finished telling the story, and we did the, the 
outdoor kitchens is what we're calling this year. This is one of them. Uh, of course, this is a normal uh, a permanent structure, but we're going to retheme it for the Flower and Garden Festival. Um, you can see on all these, we've done these these uh, kitchen gardens. They kind of reflect the plants or what's being served in the garden. Pretty easy to tell what's being focused on here. Pineapple, I don't think I have to tell you what's the, the main thing being sold. Do you have any No, no samples. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is the first one. There's 10 more as we go around, and um, I'll mention them briefly. I won't stop and talk a long time at each of them, or we'll be two, we'll be 4.30 eating, eating lunch. But before we leave, I have to say this, because as we're walking past, you're going to see these beautiful flower berms on either side of the water. There's well over 60,000 flowers on those berms right now. This is a spring crop. Another crop has to follow for the guests to have a good show when the weather warms up. So you're talking another 60,000. So in the end, you are going to have well over 100,000 flowers just in that one display. And when you consider that same thing happens throughout the entire park, we're putting a lot of bedding plants in this park for the Flower Garden Festival. Yeah. But I would imagine that as long as we have a flower and garden festival, these most years will find a way in. We'll give them a rest every once in a while. We used them in the front entrance a couple of years ago, so we gave them a rest after that. But we wanted to bring them back. The nice thing is there's so many characters, and this place takes a lot of characters. We're going to fill it with characters, um, and that's what we've done. You will notice, though, if you've been coming year after year, and if you're really a plant fan, there's a lot of differences. Once again, the face is different. It's living plant material rather than dry product. We have. Um, the, the ostriches are all new different plant material. So even though it's the same frames and the same characters, that doesn't mean that we're not continually trying to find ways to make them look better. Or quite frankly, in other ways, for plant material that might look as good or be less maintenance. Um, although in reality, it's, it's show that drives it. We'll, we'll definitely use a plant material that's a lot more maintenance if we think we'll get a lot better show. Uh, in fact, that's a pretty common decision. Same frames, but we changed them quite a bit. I mean, that was a new. Um, we improved the the Sorcerer Mickey frame probably eight nine years ago, so it's not that's not the same frame as a right. And we change poses. Yeah. So, for instance, depending on what the display is, you might I, I guess I can say cut off their arm and then have it back on in a different pose depending on the scene. We have we have with. several. Minnie, Donald. Minnie and Donald heads and Mickey's two different bodies because you know we oftentimes have the reclining Minnie, so um, we're always. I mean that's what it takes to change a pro. To change a, a character pose is a big deal. I mean it's almost as complicated as doing a brand new topiary. I think you like the bromeliads on the wings on the ostriches. Little tiny bromeliads. I won't, but this is a new one. We didn't have this last year. It's called Urban Farm Eats. It has two excellent products. One of them is a ghost pepper dusted tilapia, which is very good. It's not that hot. But the one that I think is incredibly good is a vegetarian dish. It's a scallop of eggplant with a romesco sauce and um, spaghetti squash. Make sure you get that when you come, because it is, it is, if you like eggplant, it is out of this world. Here people say, oh, it must be so fun on opening day to walk with the horticulture team. I'm like, well, not so much, because from the very, I mean, Heather and I, young our breasts are already talking about things that could be better. Or, I think that's one of the cultures that we have in horticulture at Disney is, yeah, you do good work, but we're always asking how can we do better. And another thing I wanted to point out, when people think of flower and garden, the people who do it, they always immediately think of horticulture. I should point out, we're just part of it. This isn't a horticulture festival, this is an Epcot festival. As we talk walking by this, there's several people in that building, you know, in this little uh, merchandise area, frantically getting it ready for, for the festival to open next week. So you have merchandise, food and beverage, operations, custodial. It really does take the entire park to pull off one of these, one of these festivals. And our, our folks from the other parks, we, you remember we have other theme parks, so the gardeners and the managers from Magic Kingdom from studio, everybody pitches in and helps. Right. The uh, transition, the uh, Gardner's Palette Garden, that was Kingdom, right? That was the Those are pieces of the garden. Transition Garden? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the Magic transition Kingdom. garden, the, the Gardner's Palette was planted uh, by the Magic Kingdom Gardeners. They came over here and did that. So that's one of the ways we've always been able to get these gardens done.
So you know what? It's just natural you tend to focus on the big wow things, the topiaries, the play areas, but we still keep in mind a lot of other just gardening elements. For instance, all the orchids. We put in hundreds and hundreds of orchids in, the, in these trees for the Fire and Garden Festival. Is every guest going to see? You know, every guest that walks by topiary sees it, whether or not they love plants or not. We know that not every guest are going to notice these orchids, but the ones who do get a real treat. Heather oversees all the containers. Y'all might not have noticed that I did walking by the merchandise booths. We could just do plain booths. Next time you're by them, notice all the beautiful containers of plants. Uh, we do special containers for every single pavilion. Once again, not every garden, not everyone coming here is going to know that was for festival, but the ones, but enough guests will that they'll see it as special. And you have to put enough stuff in here just to make it feel like something's going on. And I don't think if, you, if we don't throw 500 containers at this park during Flower and Garden, I think it's going to be good. We're always looking to improve and make things better. There's no better example of that than I don't think is the Lion King set. This is an old set. It came out in 95, the year after the film. Um, it actually came out in time. We took it to the Rockefeller Center uh, Flower and Garden Show in 95. Then it was in the second festival. And y'all might remember Timon was larger. Well, as we've tried to get our characters more and more realistic and capture the emotions, it became painfully fully obvious that um, Timon was way out of scale with Pumbaa. And we decided the direction we're going, the level of quality that we're looking to get, we're not going to use that Timon anymore. But without using Timon, you really can't use Pumbaa because they're a pair. So over the past two years, we haven't had Pumbaa. Oh, and quite frankly, I think Pumbaa is the strongest one of this set. So in my, in one of my favorite topiaries of all, just do it when they came out and I was on the crew and all that. So I've, I've really missed having Pumbaa in here, and I think our guests have. So there was a real urgency to do a new Timon, because you get a Timon, you get two topiaries out of the deal. We did it and we put them here. Y'all probably remember four or five years ago, we started put, you know, when we were looking for areas to put topiaries, and we used more and more topiaries, we started running out of areas. You know, there's only so many grassy areas, or landscape areas, so what we decided, I can't remember the first time we did it, not the car, maybe three, four, five years ago, well, let's just make an area. So we call them sandboxes. It was the car. <laughs> the cars in, in Japan. Japan. Yeah, I remember that. So that started it, and we now we can pretty much put a topiary wherever we want. And you know, I think the smaller topiaries are less forgiving yes. of error. Because the big topiary, you know, you put him together, he's a big guy. That little one, you have to be so careful. Everything has to be just the right size or he's out of whack. And keep in mind, too, that this isn't the whole set. The rest of them are back over here, just there behind the wall. We're going in. You'll notice these beautiful um, geranium containers. We have them quite often. It's a hanging mask. <laughs> I don't know why, why do you do that? <laughs> yeah. For several reasons. First of all, like a lot of people, I'm really excited and enthusiastic about Florida agriculture and Florida produce. Um, and we're certainly showing that here. It's amazing the number of people who come to this festival who live in Florida who aren't aware of how much food we grow in this state. Um, it really is incredible. And put your, if you have your hard hats, please put them on. Um, one of the things that we are showing and I'm, is the kumquat trees. We're actually serving kumquat pie here, which um, almost all commercial kumquats are grown in Florida. Actually, most of them over in Pasco County around Dade City. Um, actually have been fortunate enough to meet some of the people growing them. He's actually going to be here for two weeks during the festival selling kumquat products at Jenny can give you the dates. I think that's in May when Greg's selling the kum kumquat stuff in the merchandise. Oh, I'm not sure about that. So, um, and you'll notice that we have corn, it's always grown in Zellwood. Yep, in tons South Florida. Of, tons of strawberries grown down around Plant City, so... Arugula, that is arugula, right? Eric insisted these boxes have what we grow in Florida. Right, and a lot of the stuff that we're actually serving. Y'all may know, um, one of the most popular menu items last year will be back this year. It's uh, shrimp and grits, um, stone ground grits, Florida shrimp, um, corn. And the nice thing about this festival, is the food's really tied to the, the plants. So for instance, when he's cooking, when they're cooking the product in here, you have all those vegetables, the onions, the tomatoes, right on the, on the flat top being cooked with the, with the shrimp. So you get the smell. You don't just see it. You, you get to smell the food before you eat it. And I think that makes for a very nice touch. We don't have potatoes. No potatoes. I don't have potatoes. We don't have potatoes. So anyway, you get the idea. The guests can come in and see all the Florida produce being grown. 
Um, and of course, as the festival goes on, it'll get larger and larger. And that's the light. <laughs> Very proud of her. Um, you know, we just thought we'd, we're always looking to do new things to surprise our guests, and this is one of the things that we decided we we try to do. We're very pleased with the way she turned out. Uh, the challenge with face characters is always you just can't do a face with the way we planned it before, so we had to construct this. And the, the reaction's been incredible. But still, yesterday afternoon, there was a line of people lining up. And one of the things that we realized when we made Snow White improved her so much, our Disney character integrity folks says, all right, you got to do a better job on the dwarves, too. So if you look at your past year's photos of the dwarves, you'll really notice that, I mean, we've actually cut their faces and made the shape better. So, you know, by doing that, it forced us to make the dwarves better. I think now, for maybe not the first time, but it's really easy to tell the dwarves the character. So this is the first time I've seen guests looking at it. That's always, to me, a fun time to see the reaction of the characters. I saw them this morning before the park opened. Obviously, our new characters, there's a new film coming out, and we wanted to play off that. Um, and I must say, we're very pleased. The challenge here was the hair. Until the very, we weren't sure how that hair was going to turn out. We thought that the Goldilocks and the Lysenbeckia would work. In the end, it worked just fine. But there was a lot of sweating um, all along the way. Three, and there, we weren't getting any sun either. So, you know, three weeks ago, when you could still see the frame between, I was like, oh my goodness, this is going to work. Probably it wasn't until early mid this week that we could breathe a sigh of relief and we knew that we had enough sun and things were going out. And in the end, I think that's the perfect plant material for her hair. It just captures the way she looks. And if you look at her collar, you can, it's a dew and you can see some little tiny purple flowers. So yeah. if it does start flowering, that little like fluffy around her neck will be purple. And notice her ring. You know, Miss Piggy always wore the big rock. We actually made the ring, it's down there by, by Kermit, out of Talanzia. It's a little bromeliad on the ring. <laughs> we can use them everywhere. So yesterday I was walking the park. It's the first time I've been able to just on my own walk the park when I didn't have meetings. And it hit me when I started up there by um, Germany. You got Lion King, Snow White, the Muppets. This, I'm like, man, what a stretch of topiaries we put in here. Of course, Lady in the Tramp. This is another one where I talk about don't just change to, to change. We did change to change several years ago. We actually put them over by the water. The next day, we looked at them and said, that's not as good. Put them back here. This just works. That backdrop of the building really makes the topiaries pop. So this is one where I don't know that we'll ever, unless we can find a place better than this, I'm not sure we'll ever change it. I'm sure there's good places back in the park, in the pavilion, but what we've learned is it's more effective for our guests to put the topiary right on the main wall. That way they're all sure to see it. And here, the rest of the show is just all the containers. At least 200, right, you say? And if you really take your time and look around, especially in this planter over here under the camphor tree, there's some beautiful Italian uh, terracotta containers. Just the container with the vessel itself. We got, those, we got those last year. This is, awesome. this is actually every year one of my favorite pavilions. Um, I know it doesn't have a lot, you know, it has the topiaries. I just like seeing all these terracotta containers because it does remind me of being in Europe. And of course, Smokehouse. This is a repeat from last year. This is one of the most popular food and beverage areas, so we're repeating it. I was here yesterday. I don't know if the weather was right or the wind. Even from here, you can smell that smoker, even though it's not cooking. <laughs> I guess after running for 75 days last year, that smell's just impregnated into it. Um, this was great food if you didn't have it. It's the pulled pork sandwich with coleslaw or the um, brisket with collard greens and jalapeno cornbread. And this year, they're adding a couple new items. One of them is a turkey rib, which is actually the wing of a turkey, the two bone wing with one rib, one wing, or one bone taken out, and then they smoke it. You eat it just like you would a barbecue and then the Pigalicious Bacon Cupcake, <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> yes, it would be very popular, if you can say it. But, um, so we're, we're really excited about this. And Heather, do you want to talk to plants at all? Obviously, we have a topiary. Well, well, this is one of our more challenging guard set of garden boxes because they, Eric asked for a pig nut hickory and a 
the pecan tree. So the oaks were easy to provide. He's thinking of um, the smoke, the smoking wood, you know, that you put in the barbecue. So the oaks were easy to achieve, but the little puny sticks are the pecan and the pig, pig nut hickory. But we have plenty of collars, corn. <laughs> That's one thing we learned was people sell oaks as a an ornamental. The only place really that you, people sell the the, the, the pecan certainly is is for production. So they send them bare rooted sticks. So this is the second year and they're still somewhat stick-like. <laughs> Maybe by next year they'll be nice and full. Obviously, they're deciduous trees, unlike the live oaks. There's no leaves on them right now. Later in the festival, they will be. We thought it was important to show that. Well, I was just going to say, I think this is one of the nicest displays of the flowers in the tone. I agree. And, and when we first started talking food in the Flower and Garden Festival, it was barbecue. We thought it was a natural fit to add barbecue. So this probably is the... The earliest time anyone's speaking, I'm talking five, six, seven, eight years ago, is there any way we can bring barbecue to this festival? And the reason we wanted to is an easy story to tell. You could talk about the rubs, which use all the herbs and spices, or you could talk about the, the wood, which uses the different trees. This was kind of exciting because in the past, the landscape architects asked us to plant in bales, so we apparently used hay. But we have an author that is going to be at the festival center that's going to give a presentation, and he has a book. And so we read this book on straw bale gardening, and it's so cool. They, they, he has illustrations of people that have them like lined up in their front yard. But you have, he has a whole process of how you condition that bale with fertilizer and water like 10 days out before you plant it. And then we planted them. Now the only problem we're having, because this is brand new, fresh to us, we need to slow down on the watering because we're growing a lot of mushrooms in there. So they're staying wetter than we would have thought they would stay. But it's really a neat concept because if you did that in your yard, once you're done, about the same timing when the vegetables are finished, that bale starts to decompose and you can just spread it around and you get a really great compost. Or mulching. Yeah, or mulch from the straw. So it's kind of twofold. And, and that kind of plays into the entire purpose of this garden. We call it the backyard play garden. You know, there's a lot of concern in the America about kids not getting enough time with nature. So what we're trying to do is give families um, lots of different ideas of fun, cute, interesting things that the parents and the children can do in their yard. The garden is presented by Gogo -Go Squeeze. Um, which also likes to focus on playing and healthy products. So uh, this is a garden that I think is close to a lot of our hearts who like to see children gardening and want to see the future generations be interested in what's after all our profession. And it is fun to see kids walk in here and see all this. You know, we have the pizza garden and we've had the, the pie garden. I think we're having a... We're going to have pallets. We have yeah. a cart planted. We have some chairs planted. So just lots of crazy ideas that, you know, yeah, a kid may not be excited about planting like this, but if you can do something fun and exciting, then maybe they'll, you know, it might get the kid or even the parent excited about getting out in the yard. Um, you know, one of the things we we find is anyone who has children and who also gardens knows the best way to get children eating vegetables is have them grow it. If they grow it and they know it, they're going to be much more likely likely to eat it. I've certainly found that with the kids that I, I know in my life. Um, you want them to start eating something, grow a garden. And that's the story we talk about a lot in this in this, in this garden. Yeah, Plus, it has fun. a nice playground that we add um, for, the, for the kids to, to relax in, or the kids to play, the parents to relax. And I think we did a great job of picking colors in here because that orange and purple with that little yellowy color is beautiful.